Hello, scholars. Mr. Long signing on for U.S. government. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the mechanics uh, of the legislative branch in Congress, in particular, how a bill becomes a law. So first question we want to ask, what is the purpose of Congress? Uh, Congress is the legislative arm of the United States government. Their job is to create laws. Pretty simple, create laws, and by extension, also creating a couple policies. Uh, what are laws? In simple terms, laws tell us what we can and cannot do as citizens of this country. For example, you cannot drive uh, a car under the influence of alcohol, steal your neighbor's property, or build a nuclear bomb in your basement. Those are all illegal. Laws also establish new government programs, allocate funding, and or allocate funding for new projects, and allocate funding to pay for government activities and services that are already in place. So the process by which a bill becomes a law is fairly complicated. There are a lot of steps. Uh, the graphic I decided to use here is going to include pretty much all of the steps that can go into a bill becoming a law. I'm going to try to summarize this to make this as easy to digest and as simple as possible. To start, a bill has to be introduced by a member of Congress, whether it's a senator or a member of the House of Representatives. So let's say in our example, the bill is gonna be introduced in the House of Representatives. From there, the bill moves on to committees and subcommittees where they're talking about the bill. So let's say we're, for example, this is a bill to outlaw animal abuse. No more, yeah, no, no more smacking puppies and kitties around. So we're going to outlaw animal abuse across the entire country. So first step, it goes to the House of Representatives where the writer of the bill proposes it to the House. It's assigned to a committee and a subcommittee where they expand on the idea, talk about it, refine it, and improve upon the bill. From there, or in the committee, the committee goes ahead and marks up the bill with changes, usually adding a couple things or uh, taking stuff out and just revising it or editing the bill. From there, the bill will go from, or it'll be voted on by the committee and then the committee will send it back to the House of Representatives where it's gonna go on the House calendar where it will then be up for debate. So when this bill finally gets back out of committee and it goes to the House, at this point, the House is going to distribute copies of the bill. A uh, bunch of representatives are going to take turns debating it. Maybe they like it. Maybe they don't like it. Maybe they don't like the specific word or their phrase. And they're going to really go through it practically word by word in some cases to make the bill passable. From there, once they have their copy of the bill, the House is going to vote on it, and effectively what they need is 51% of the House to approve the bill. So half of 435, we're looking at, what, 218? If they get their 218, the House is going to send the bill up to... Sorry, I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, it's going to go up to the Senate. Now, I didn't mention in here, but at a bunch of different steps here, the bill can be sent to uh, effectively killed in committee where the committee has the bill or they're revising it and either they don't like it or they can't agree on it and the bill just kind of sits on the side and doesn't really get brought up again or it effectively just lingers until the session of Congress runs out and then the bill is dead. So... That can happen at a variety of times. There's a lot of pitfalls and perils for these bills to survive to become a law. So once the House likes the bill, it's going to be sent over to the Senate, where the Senate is going to go through the same process. The Senate says it's to their own committee. They mark up the bill. It's voted on the committee. It goes on the calendar. They debate it. And then the Senate will vote on it themselves. Once the Senate votes on it themselves, the two bills have to be unified. And so what we're looking at here is the House version, the one that made it over here, 
that may be slightly different or more or more so uh, different than the bill that we get in the Senate. And so the two different versions of the bill have to be combined for just one bill. So they're going to take ideas from both, hopefully come up with one version of the bill that both the House and the Senate likes, which is really tricky. And then once they have that one bill, they both chambers vote on that, you know, that that combined bill. And if they get the necessary 51% from both chambers of houses, it can go to the president. So it's on its way to the White House and it's on the president's desk. Now the president has three options in front of them. First one is to sign the bill and have it become a law. Too easy. President likes the bill, it's a law. Second version is the president does not like the bill. He or she thinks, nah, this is, you know, this is a bad, this is a bad bill. There's too many things wrong with this. I don't support this idea. It's against my own personal values and policies. I'm gonna kill it. And so the president is going to veto the bill and it goes back to Congress where then they have the option to either work its way around again, maybe make some corrections to hopefully get it passed a second time. Because it might be as simple, simple as something as the president saying like, hey, that word right there, I don't like it. Get rid of it. We need a different word. They send it back through the committees. They make the adjustments and they vote on it and resend it to the president where if they make the corrections, the president should sign it. Um, if Congress gets a bill vetoed, so I'm going to write that hopefully over here. So let's say the bill is vetoed. If the bill is vetoed, on one hand, Congress can resubmit it. And that's what I just went over with the revisions. Or they can override. Whoop, that is sloppy. Override the veto. And override the veto... They need two thirds of both chambers. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Chambers. There we go. Uh, they need two thirds of both chambers to override it. And when Congress overrides the veto, it forces the bill into becoming a law, even if the president doesn't like it. Um, overriding a veto doesn't happen very often, ma mainly because. There's a reason the president vetoed it, and Congress doesn't want to always upset the president by going over his or her head. So typically, they'll either let it die or revise it and send it back. But it has happened in the past where president or Congresses will override the veto. And I want to draw your attention to something. For a bill to be passed, we needed 51 percent. For an override we need 66% or two thirds. So for a bill just to make it to the president's desk, it's doable to override it. It's a little trickier. And that's another issue is that maybe the bill doesn't have enough support in Congress to get that two thirds majority to have it passed as a law. Um, so those are the first two options. One, president signs it into law. Two, the president vetoes it where either Congress will resubmit it or Congress will override it or Congress will let it die. The third option is called a pocket veto. A pocket veto is where the president has the bill and they don't sign it and they don't uh, veto it. And within that 10 days, if Congress, if the session of Congress ends, then Congress isn't there to get the bill, the signed bill back and it dies. So that's one way the president can kill the bill is if the timing is right, they can just wait 10 days for Congress to be out of session and they don't have to worry about it. If the president doesn't sign it and the 10 days passes and Congress is still in session, then the bill automatically becomes a law as well. So like I said, this, it, it's a complicated process. There's a lot of moving pieces. It takes a lot of time and energy for a bill to become a law. So anytime there's a new law, um, hopefully you'll appreciate <laughs> what, kind of blood, sweat, and tears went into making that bill a law. Uh, the textbook also talks about how many bills become laws, like the rate of it. And as you'll see in the textbook, there is a abhorrent amount of bills that 
do not become laws um, for one reason or another. But the chances of a congressperson having their bill passed into a law is fairly minuscule. Uh, I think that's all I need to cover here with how a bill becomes a law. We'll talk more about this in class. There are a plethora of YouTube videos out there explaining this process probably more eloquently <laughs> than I have, uh, maybe more clearly in some places. So if the, you're still stuck on how a bill becomes a law, either ask me in class or go poke around the textbook or the internet and see what you can find. But hopefully my explanation will help in some ways. As for, oh, cool, uh, sorry. One other thing, uh, we'll be doing this in class, but for my remote learners, or if you wanna explore it on your own, there is a way for you to see what kind of bills are uh, being talked about in Congress and where it is in the process. You can actually read the bill itself to see what's going on. If you go to congress.gov, it'll show you, it'll take you to this web page here, and it gives you a big page with a whole bunch of different things. And there's a tab in here, a little section called Current Legislative Activities. Well, that's where the members of Congress are talking about bills or different uh, uh, resolutions that they're trying to pass. So, for example, so you can click on any one of them. And for this example that I pulled from the other day, this one, the House of Representatives Bill 127, which is HR is 127, or H HR is the House of Representatives uh, Bill 127 for the session. If you see like an S127, uh, that would be a bill that originated in the Senate. So House of Representatives 127, if you click on that like I did, it'll show you again the code for the bill. Whoop. There we go. Technology is tricky sometimes. It'll give you the code for the bill. It'll tell you the name of the bill. So the Sabika Sheik Firearm Licensing and Registration Act talks about who the sponsor is. So this is the original author of the bill. Uh, when it was introduced, which committee it's in. So it's in the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives. Some of the actions. So most recently, it was referred to the Judiciary Committee uh, on the 4th of January, 2021. And then it also tells you where the bill is in this process. So, so far it's been introduced. And then when it passes the House, that'll be filled in. When it passes the Senate, it'll be filled in. When it goes to the President, it'll be filled in. And when it becomes law, that'll also be filled in. So this one has just been introduced fairly recently. And if, you, you know, if you're invested in figuring out what this Firearm Licensing and Registration Act is, you can go and see more about it, such as the text, any actions members of Congress have taken. Uh, different amendments that have been added to it, a whole bunch of stuff that you can kind of explore if you want to know how Congress or what Congress is going to do with this law. You can also, if you really want to be a government nerd, you can go and find out who is on the Judiciary Committee because you might have a representative, whether in the Senate or the House, uh, for your district and your state that is working on this bill. And in which case, if you like this bill, you can write them a letter or shoot them an email saying, hey, like, I, you know, I'm tracking this bill. This looks really great. I fully support it. Like, you know, if you vote for this, if you help out this bill, you're going to get a lot of brownie points with me. Or if you don't like it after reading, you're like, no, this is a bad bill. This is scary. Go ahead and write them and shoot them an email and be like, hey, like, you know, I, you know, I'm one of your constituents. I'm in your district. You need to get rid of this bill because it's scary and I don't like it. And so if you want to be more involved in government and how your representatives uh, behave, you can be informed on these bills and actually talk to your congresspeople about it uh, to give them your recommendation and your advice. So that should be mostly it for this slide deck. Like I said, this is a pretty short one. We'll be talking about this a fair amount in class, especially with the legislative branch and how things happen, but hopefully this will get uh, you started on how or what the legislative branch is up to. So check on learning questions for you. These are the same ones that are in Canvas. The first one, who may propose a bill? Uh, we talked about that at the beginning of the video. Second question, how many representatives and senators must vote in favor for a bill to pass each chamber? And the third question, how can Congress override a presidential veto of a bill? And that one I talked about, made a few notes on the right-hand side of the screen uh, two slides ago with the actual little flowchart thing. Uh, so if you missed it, 
go back to that portion of the video, check that out, and type me some informed answers. Uh, we'll continue talking about this in class. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or follow up with me at school. And other than that, I think we are good to go. Mr. Long, over and out.